So Neuralink recently just did a show and tell uh, live stream, which we were fortunate enough to live stream ourselves, as well as discuss with some um, people in the field and our video editor, Mike. You can check that out in the link below, in the description below. Um, but we wanted to talk briefly about some highlights from that stream, as well as some things that we're excited about from the stream um, and some stuff that we're um, excited about with Neuralink moving forward. Yeah, definitely. So one thing to note, so yeah, we're going to go over all of the notable things that happened, explain the science, um, and how our opinions and, and outlook on Neuralink has changed. Um, so the first thing to note is that this was primarily a recruiting event. So they currently have 385 employees, but they have a tremendous amount of money. It's over 350 million, I believe, at this point, maybe even 380. Um, and they are looking to scale quite quickly. So um, one thing that, that came out of this is there really was quite a subdued tone um, from mm. Elon Musk and the rest of the team. Um, and so if you followed Neuralink, you'll, you'll know that there um, had been a, a decent amount of controversy that had followed the company for a while just because Elon Musk, um, in his traditional Elon Musk way, was like, oh, they're going to be able to do all these amazing things, like, we're going to connect minds to AI and all of that stuff, and the neuroscience community kind of rolled their eyes a little bit, and they were like, okay, but, like, a lot of this has been done, and, like, um, you know, there's a lot of unnecessary hype, I think, um, and that created backlash and hiring issues for them, and so it really was more subdued, it was more about the technology. Um, and we had a lot of other speakers, like Elon was probably only on stage for 10 minutes uh, in total. Um, and so it was really focused on the team, which I think was well done um, and a shift that the research community will appreciate um, overall and those who are in the industry will appreciate. Um, they yeah. Were, yeah, they were also a lot more careful with their words. Um, now, it's it should be noted that there aren't any papers that they've published, so we're sort of taking them at their word. Um, but a lot of the technological uh, demonstrations that they showed were um, quite well planned and, and were very impressive, assuming that um, it consistently works to the degree that they are talking about here. Yeah, seeing that shift from more um, optimistic timelines and, and shift from sort of um, unrealistic expectations for Neuralink into a more reserved, uh, I mean, even in the, the live stream itself, we saw Elon come out and say, you know, with, within six months, we're going to be in human subject researches or in, in, within human subjects, uh, have, have this device within human subjects. And uh, immediately, almost immediately afterwards, one of the employees from Neuralink came out and said, well, we're hoping that within six months we'll be within human subjects. We'll be, um, so I, yeah, we're hoping within six months that they will start the clinical trial process. Yeah. So they yeah. received uh, an IDE, um, which is an exemption, the ability to kind of fast track a technology. Um, and But there are other hoops that they have to clear. And so... So yes, yeah, so they are hoping to start recruiting for clinical trials in six months. Um, if you're interested, by the way, they have a link on their website, which we can share, uh, where you can sign up if you are someone with a, a qualifying disability, um, if you're interested in, in joining those. But yes, the, the engineers were uh, very, very cautious in, in what they said, which I think was, was good for expectation setting for this type of technology. Yeah, I think moving forward, they need to keep that strategy um, as their primary strategy rather than sort of sort of selling the pie in the sky idea of what Neuralink will be someday. Um, and I, th I think that that's totally fine. I mean, they're only a, what a six or seven year old, six year old company right now. Yeah, um, so they've they've yeah. they've got they've got plenty of time. Um, you know, there was some stuff in the news cycle about Neuralink not doing well with their animal subjects, uh, which they were very heavily focused on at this at this live stream in terms of showing you know we take care of our animals you know they're not being abused or anything like that I thought that was an interesting um focus for yeah. them uh within this this stream yeah they they really addressed that head-on which was good to see so the the controversy was apparently seventeen thousand doctors um signed on to 
some petition to have them release information because they believe that there were abuses done at UC Davis, which is where they were originally doing research. Neuralink has taken all of that research into their own facilities now. Um, and we're really quite careful to say like the, the look, look how the animals are enjoying it and it's voluntary. Um, and there are always, I think, parts of animal research that are a little bit like squeamish or like, uh, but I think that they did address that quite well, and at least in what they showed, um, it they seem to be following all ethical practices quite well. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about their advances in the technology. Um, they announced that the new version of the Neuralink will have 16,000 channels, uh, which is phenomenal. In a couple years, yeah. So they've quadrupled yeah. since their last one. So they, they claim, although they did not show a demo, they claim that they can record from 4,096 channels at a time, but yes, like Colin said, they say that in the near term they can expand to 16,000 channels. I don't know if that's on one link, so the link is um, the their processing device that sits in the skull, um, or if it's multiple, but that is really quite impressive. Yeah, certainly. Hopefully it's not one of those pie-in-the-sky moment, uh, Neuralink moment things that we're kind of used yeah. to at this point. But um, you have to take everything they say with a grain of salt, for sure. Certainly. Uh, they have they they discussed a lot of their manufacturing processes, a lot about the the internal chips and stuff that they're using for filtering and pre-processing all their neural data, which is quite a bit of data. Obviously, these coming off all, you know even four thousand channels or ten twenty four channels or whatever, it's quite a bit um, of information. So uh, we won't get too much into the nitty gritty details of that right now, but uh, it was quite interesting I, I recommend you know checking out the full live stream if you're interested which once again we covered uh, link down below in the description so what did you think I, of one one thing that they talked about was that they are doing processing on board in the link which is embedded in the skull so they've built a custom ASIC um, which is doing processing yeah so doing processing of the signals on board and then sending that over bluetooth so what are your th you have a better background in this stuff colin than i do so what were your thoughts on that yeah like i said i think they've moved a lot of the processing stuff to be actually on the board and by the actual electrodes right which makes sense um it doesn't make a whole lot of sense they're using they're using bluetooth right to transmit data back to their software systems um and you can't really stream that large amount of data over Bluetooth. Uh, like there's no, especially with invasive systems, even EEG systems sometimes struggle with Bluetooth uh, in terms of their ability to, to send all that information. It, uh, e Bluetooth just doesn't have that bandwidth to handle, you know, 1024 channels of, of internal neural data, uh, which is actually what was surprising to me that they even are using Bluetooth, I, you know, uh, you'd think they'd use like 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz um, sort of Wi-Fi signals to transmit all that data. Um, I, I'm actually curious as to why they're using Bluetooth at all. I guess the, 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 the concept is, or the idea is, you know, you can interface with phones and stuff a lot easier if you have a Bluetooth system. Um, but there's a lot of limitations that come with, with, with Bluetooth that... Um, you know, really, it really surprises me that they're they're using that primarily for their their invasive system. Um, another interesting thing that they talked about was their um, their power management system and the way that their charging ports and stuff work. Uh, there was a, a piece where uh, they had a rhesus monkey uh, recharge his um, by just like sticking his head into a charging port and getting a, a smoothie essentially for doing so. Um, so yeah, I think I think that uh, seeing the way that they're updating their hardware and stuff is is incredibly interesting, and seeing the actual ins and outs of how this device works is is really really cool. Um, but you know, let's let's try to get this to human subjects and see what happens there. Yeah, definitely. And so um, in the demos, what we saw was. Uh, cursor control was was the main thing. So there was this hype ahead of time of Neuralink released this tweet um, where letters were slowly being typed across the screen and people were like, oh, is that using a brain-computer interface? But of course, they aren't in humans yet, so that was a little bit confusing. So what they ended up doing was teaching a monkey to move a cursor uh, with his thoughts onto uh, targets, um, and the targets were overlaid over letters and then like click the target when he got there. So they would 
put in, so they would have the letters up there, he would go select those, and that would output words. Um, obviously, the monkey doesn't have an understanding of those words, but it shows that that would translate very well to uh, computer control. And now this is something that's been done before many, many times using BlackRock's Utah Array um, in humans. But uh, I think the thing that's notable is that at least from this demo, and we do not have papers, so we, we don't know, um, you know, to the extent of how valid their data is, but at least from looking at these demos, it seems like it's on the same level of, uh, as BlackRock's arrays in terms of capability to, to do that task and drive computer control. So considering that um, this device really, that they really only started development of this in 2016, um, it's quite impressive how quickly it has caught up um, to, at least in terms of that one very specific application, to the, the gold standard of the devices that are out there right now. Interjecting here, as I was editing the video, I noticed that there were a few things that Colin and I didn't talk about that I really think should be in the video. So here's one. They demoed the surgery robot that is actually implanting the threads, implanting the electrodes. Um, and so they gave us a demo in a fake brain. So here you can see all of these targets that the robot is selecting to avoid blood vessels. These darker areas, um, I'm assuming, are our simulated blood vessels. And that's really important um, to reduce trauma to the brain. You don't want blood spilling out all over the place. And this was the first time that we've seen a demo, at least performed live, of the uh, Neuralink robot for implantation. So that's really interesting. And it's a little slow, so I'm going to skip to right there and play it for us. Um, but we can see that here comes the needle coming in, and then it will poop, put a thread right in there. And you can see there's some slack on the thread. And I'm going to go ahead and skip to right at around the hour, because then they... Oh, There it is. Because then they come back and show that the robot, over the course of about 20 minutes, has put in this many electrodes, however many that is. It's pretty impressive. One thing that they show later is that they really worked a lot on the needle design because they wanted. Um, so, what they ended up doing is making something that can penetrate through the dura. So, the dura is this layer um, of, it's a membrane that sits on top of the brain and it is kind of like leather. It's really thick and hard to get through. Normally when you're putting in a brain implant, you remove the a part of the skull, you remove the dura, you put the brain implant in, and then the, the dura kind of grows back and messes with things. So what they're thinking is, that let's just puncture through that, but that's pretty difficult because you have to have a needle that's strong enough to go through that, but small enough to not cause uh, brain damage and all of that. So it is a very fine balance, and they were working on that quite a bit. The other thing that I want to show that is really, really cool is, actually there are two other things. So one is that they have a focus on making visual prosthetics. So I will just kind of talk this through, but basically they are looking at stimulating areas in the back of the brain that are associated with um, early visual processing. and using a Neuralink to have some low fidelity type of visual interface. So what they're showing here is when they are stimulating the monkey's visual areas, he's seeing something called phosphenes. It's these little specks of light that, that go around. And they, they taught the monkey to look at those specks of light. So when you see this little green thing flying around like we did before, which we can see again here, then we know that it is seeing something because it's being taught to look towards those phosphenes. Um, so we know that it's actually working. Yeah, so you can see here's where the phosphine is supposed to be, and the monkey does, in fact, look in that direction. So that's interesting in terms of what that could mean for a uh, future visual neuroprosthetic. So you can see over here, this is a pretty crude version of what we're seeing here. But if you have no vision, um, this could help you navigate in the world, and it shows a lot of promise for the future of what we'll be able to do. So finally, the last part now that I want to focus on is this piece where they're talking about 
circumventing a severed part of the spinal cord. So normally, if you are going to move your hand, that signal originates up in your brain, it goes down your spinal cord, and then the spinal cord is actually the thing that coordinates with the muscles. Let's see if we can get that up. Yeah, so signals come down from the brain, but the brain is really just saying, I want to move my hand here. It's the spinal cord that's coordinating that. So what researchers have done, this has been done for a few decades um, to varying degrees, but they take signals from the brain and then they put it into the spinal cord and you can actually cut the spinal cord and get some level of, of motion control. So that's what Neuralink is showing us here. Um, so, so yeah, they're showing that you put a stimulation device right there, stimulation device into the spinal cord. That's we're seeing a cross section, a little slice of the spinal cord. Um, and then that goes and the spinal cord will then uh, zap the muscles to um, make it move. Uh, and then what we're seeing here is the proof um, that what they're doing is actually working. So they have placed these little balls on the pig, which allow 3D cameras to track the pig's movement. And at the same time, they're recording signals from the motor area of the brain that would be controlling those muscles. And they're seeing, can we simulate, like, or how close can we guess from the brain activity what is actually happening, this real movement? And so they decode the motion um, activity and, oops, that's not what that one is. Hold on. Um, well, anyway, what they found was that it was really quite close. I think it's that one. Yeah. So here is the the motion. You can see one of these, I think the blue one is the actual motion versus the decoded motion. So um, it is working quite well there. And the other thing that they did is now, so that was for recording to see if we could actually get reliable signals from the brain to then send to the, to the body. Um, but now in this example, they're showing what it looks like to uh, in this example, they're showing what it's like to actually stimulate the spinal cord and cause a movement. So let's just get that up there. Yep. So you're going to see that when stimulation is applied, this uh, pig is going to kick its leg up, um, which we should see in a second here. Um, but basically, this, this could be used for people who have um, who have paralysis due to a spinal cord injury and ideally instead of needing an exoskeleton there you go you see that leg up there uh, instead of needing an exoskeleton you could just reroute this all right I'm gonna toss uh, you back to the video with Colin but I just wanted to add that in uh, overall thoughts from this entire presentation you know I I really think that they're moving in the right direction I think they should keep taking their time and I think that the expectations from some of the higher ups in the company need to be um, roped in a little bit. Uh, you know, we're not going to be able to read people's brainwaves with, you know, read people's thoughts or whatever within the next two years. Like that's just like with perfect accuracy or whatever. I think that uh, there were expectations from people, people higher up uh, as to where this technology would be. Um, and I, and I don't think that it's, bad for you know this type of technology to to take time to incubate i mean um you know we're seeing some really awesome studies come out of uh research centers and even Neuralink proper um so i i just i think they just need to take their time and they just need to keep chugging forward um and eventually it'll be there eventually it'll be ready for human use and um, i'm excited to see what happens then yeah I agree. I think I think all of that's important, um, and that's been a concern of ours, um, and I think the industry at large that they would rush too quickly and then hurt someone. That's bad for the industry. It's it's bad for the patients that wouldn't get help or that might be afraid of of using a device. Um, but I was uh, more reassured than I have been after watching the event last night um, in terms of just again that tone of of being realistic. Um, one other thing that really stuck out to me is they spent a lot of time talking about how they're building up their manufacturing capability and thinking about how this device will be commercialized. And so they talked about they have a new um, a new facility in Texas that is just dedicated to manufacturing these devices. 
Um, they also are building out the robots, of course, that can, can do the surgery and are even starting to, to look into making outpatient facilities, so a place where these surgeries um, could be done. And that's really forward thinking, um, which was surprising to me. And it was surprising to me because they're not even in humans yet. So they don't know fully that these devices are going to work in humans. And if they've invested all this money into these manufacturing capabilities and now there's a change, like there's a lot of money that would be wasted uh, along the way. So I think there are two ways you could look at that. One is management being a little bit over ambitious with their um, approach to getting into the market or the other one um, and both could be true but the the other one is that they really really believe in the efficacy of this device um, that they're willing to make this bet so early a bet that I don't even really think that they have to make um, I think that it's something that a, a goal that they've set that's that's quite ambitious but I think that while there's concern there, the interesting part of that is that they really are thinking about the implementation of this of these devices as commercial um, medical equipment and already thinking about what that looks like down the line. So yeah, I think I think that was interesting to see. And then my overall thoughts is I've I've generally like a lot of the rest of um, the neurotech neuroscience community have approached Neuralink with quite a bit of. Um, skepticism uh, just because of these claims, these really, really overzealous uh, claims, but I was impressed with the tone shift. I appreciated that. And they have shown um, in these pre recorded demos, again, assuming that those are all accurate, they have shown real capability and um, impressive technological development um, with this. Um, and so, of course, we'll be continuing to follow Neuralink and, and other companies um, and competitors in the industry, which there are many um, that are that are popping up. Um, and so we will continue to follow that. Uh, but, you know, good for the industry overall to have uh, more technology coming out and good for the industry to have more responsible communication. So hats off to them. I think they did a, a good event overall. Um, so, yeah, it was good to see. Yeah. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this sort of content. We have more videos in the pipeline right now um, that we're excited to release. Uh, some more project-based videos as well as a interesting uh, lab uh, tour that we're going to be having, uh, releasing here soon, actually. Um, so thanks for all the support. For if you want to see Neuralink's more... competitors, BlackRock, actually. Yes, <laughs> yes. So if you're interested in this technology and um, and what others are, are doing with it, and BlackRock's been around uh, a little bit longer, um, you know, definitely stay subscribed. See you in the next video. Yeah, thanks. thanks for checking us out. Bye.